Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Um, we're going to get started at the top of the hour, which is right now. Um, welcome uh, to the Safe Routes Partnership webinar, California's Active Transportation Program Getting Started. Uh, my name is Jonathan Matz. I'm California Senior Policy Manager here at the National Partnership, um, and I am delighted to facilitate today's webinar. That's going to cover strategies to generate funding for active transportation prog programs and projects at the local level. Uh, a little bit about uh, the Safe Routes Partnership um, before we get into the meat of it. Um, we uh, are a, a, a nonprofit organization that works to advance safe walking and bicycling to and from schools. Um, rolling generally, I think we like to say, including things like scooters and wheelchairs. Um, and focus on improving the health uh, and well-being of kids um, of all races, income levels, and abilities um, as a critical step in fostering the creation of healthy communities for all. Um, we aim to improve the quality of life uh, for kids, families, and communities. Uh, we advance policy change um, and um, catalyze support for safe, healthy, active communities and then um, turn around and share what we've learned um, as expertise to others working in the field. A little bit of housekeeping uh, for this webinar. Uh, to, if, you're, if this is the first time that you're using GoToWebinar, um, to the left you'll see the GoToWebinar viewer through which uh, you'll see this presentation. Um, and um, to the right, you'll see the GoToWebinar control panel where you can raise your hand, um, ask questions, and also select the audio that you'll use. Um, that control panel is going to collapse automatically when it's not in use, but to keep it open, you can click the view menu um, and uncheck auto hide control panel. Uh, there's two options for listening to us today. Um, you can be listening on your phone or you can use your mic and speakers. Um, if you have sound problems with one of those, try the other. Um, and um, you can send us a chat message as we're going along to let us know if you're having any technical issues. We'll try to address them uh, as they come up. Um, so all viewers are muted, but we want to hear your input. So you can uh, use the questions box uh, to ask questions to the speakers for the Q&A portion, um, which will take place after all the speakers have presented. And we'll try to answer a question if there is time at the end. Uh, after we're done uh, with the presentation today, uh, you might want to view it again or send the link to um, colleagues and friends who may have missed it. And if uh, if you want to see it after we're done, you can uh, you can do so by going to saferoutspartnership.org. On the um, on the resource tab, you click that heading. Uh, you click on webinars in the list on the left hand side, and all past webinars are stored uh, there for you. Um, so we encourage you to not only uh, circle back to this one, but also stroll our archives uh, and see what else uh, might be there that could be of use for you. Um, and now for our speakers, I'll briefly present them before getting into a little bit the goals of this webinar series. Uh, we have an excellent group of speakers. Um, you see me down there at the bottom and uh, up at the top. Uh, first, uh, our first presenter will be Melanie Mullis uh, from the City of Ontario, where she's Principal Planner of Transportation and Mobility. Next up will be Edgar Garabay, who uh, works at the Tuolumne River Trust um, in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, he's community relations manager there. And then finally, uh, Corey Wilkerson, who uh, currently serves as active transportation coordinator for the city of Santa Ana. Uh, quickly, uh, the goals of this webinar series. So this is the first time that we're uh, doing webinars focused on California's active transportation program. Um, and the goal is to help uh, communities, jurisdictions that maybe are under-resourced, applying to the ATP for the first time, maybe you've applied in the past uh, but haven't had the result that you like and you're interested in hearing from those um, who have unlocked the keys to success um, to, to learn from their experience. Um, along the same lines, we published about a year ago a guide to the ATP process um, and the guidelines for it, which is available on our website at the, the link that you see there. Um, we, there will be two more webinars in this 
series currently unscheduled, but sometime around early winter, uh, we'll be focusing specifically on uh, the value uh, of applying to do an active transportation plan through the ATP. Uh, we think it's um, a particularly good first step for, for smaller communities. And then uh, in the spring, shortly before the uh, call for projects, we'll just go over what has changed in the guidelines and the scoring uh, in this cycle, ATP cycle five, uh, compared to previous cycles, just in case uh, you've applied before and want to kind of a quick um, notice on, on uh, what you should be looking out to do differently this time around. Uh, so ATP cycle five is going to be getting underway soon. I just wanted to share with uh, folks here the draft timeline. Um, and emphasis again on the word draft here. Um, but uh, the California Transportation Commission uh, it plans to start uh, workshops around the state in the month of November uh, to start working first on the guidelines and the scoring rubrics. Uh, the hope is to have those um, wrapped up in January with the guidelines uh, presented to the commission in, in 2020 and for the call for projects to be uh, announced after the March CTC meeting. Um, and uh, for project applications to be due, uh, postmarked, in other words, on June 15th, uh, with uh, initial recommendations from the statewide and small urban rural components coming out in October 2020. So pretty much a year from now, uh, we would anticipate knowing who was successful in cycle five. Uh, the application types, uh, these will carry over from cycle four, uh, which was the first time that uh, there were five different application types. And uh, you'll see them listed here. You can apply to do a plan. You can apply to do uh, what's known as non-infrastructure. That's encouragement and education programs, usually in schools, but not exclusively. Um, and then if you are looking um, to make physical improvements uh, in your community, there are three different uh, infrastructure application types, uh, depending on how much uh, money you are requesting. Um, and the difference within those types essentially has to do with the amount of, of detail that is asked for uh, from the applicants. The idea being that the more money you're requesting, the, the more scrutiny is going to be applied. Um, these were the thresholds in terms of dollar amounts from ATP cycle four. Uh, those may or may not stay the same in cycle five. Uh, if they change, the differences should not be particularly uh, drastic. And then on one note, for any of those infrastructure categories, you can also um, apply, you can do what's known as a combined infrastructure and non-infrastructure. So a public works agency may be looking to improve uh, access to a particular school and the public health department or the department of education uh, may be looking to pair that with in-school bike radios and education programs, that kind of thing. So you can combine those all into one um, application. And in fact, doing so tends to uh, increase the chances of being successful. Uh, one change that we do know about, and this is actually the way it used to be in cycles one through three, um, in cycle five, um, applicants will be able to apply directly to their metropolitan planning organizations. If, you if your community is in one of the 10 biggest, you can skip the statewide uh, competition and apply directly to, say for example, SCAG or the MTC. Um, so you would be, uh, skipping out on the opportunity to get statewide funding, um, but uh, it's potentially a, a little bit um, less of a burdensome application to do that. So that would be the trade-off. Uh, going back to the speakers, I'm going to hand it over to Melanie now. And uh, can we see her screen? Uh, Melanie has been a professional public sector planner for the past 35 years, uh, the last 14 of which have been with the city of Ontario. In 2012, she created an interdepartmental team to work on uh, active transportation infrastructure needs in the community, which includes engineering, public works, healthy Ontario, recreation and planning staff. Uh, this team has successfully applied for four active transportation program grants, one each cycle, uh, those awarded each cycle, uh, as well as a transformative climate communities grant, uh, which will result in nearly $18 million in active transportation improvements in the community. Uh, she currently serves on the technical advisory uh, committee of the active transportation 
uh, program along with me. Um, and Melanie, without further ado, take it away. Good morning. Um, my part of the presentation today is sort of the nuts and bolts of how to get ready for an application, sort of the broad overview. Um, so initially, you obviously need to read the ATP guidelines. Obviously, Cycle 5 guidelines are not available yet. But as Jonathan mentioned, I don't believe that they're going to be substantially changing um, the intent of, of where the, the grants are going. So focusing on making sure you're focusing on increasing walking and biking, increasing pet and bike safety, and uh, improving public health are, are the three primary goals of, of the ATP program. So your first step really is to identify your project and get your team together. And your team is, um, is going to be staff or members of the community or whoever you can find who will champion the project. And identifying the project is, is a twofold effort. You may have an idea about where your project should be or what kinds of improvements you think may be needed, but um, you need to have public input into that. Then getting an action plan, getting background information, community outreach, which Edgar will talk about more on, and then preparing your, your ATP application. So to identify your project, um, it's critical that you have it based on the community's um, need. I have used some community-based organizations. The police department is great with their observations, their collision reports. Um, so maybe it shouldn't be a surprise, but our teens here in the community, we have um, teen action committees at each of the community centers, have been very involved in doing walk audits and because they're walkers and bikers, and that, that is how they get around and to, to a large extent. And so they're a really good resource for understanding what the actual community needs are. Um, odds are that your community uh, logs in where public requests are, where someone's asked about handicap ramps or uh, a, a safe crossing point, that, that kind of thing. Um, this last round, I used uh, SurveyMonkey, um, which is a free um, survey opportunity to uh, gather information. It collects it for you. The uh, On the right-hand side shows one of the questions we were asking about, what would make you want to walk more. Out of that question, um, you know, the biggest number uh, one answer for us on, on cycle four was more shade trees in Ontario, Inland Empire. It's very hot here, and this particular neighborhood is um, shade poor. So uh, we focused on that and in a subsequent conversation after the ATB uh, application was submitted, I asked Caltrans, um, Teresa from Caltrans, whether that was acceptable, and she said, yes, as long as I documented. Well, I provided all the documentation for all the questions we asked and showed, you know, more than 80% of the people said they would walk more if they had more shade trees. So it's using the tools you have available um, to, uh, to tell your story um, as best you can. So a part of identifying your project is determining where your destinations are that you're going to serve. So you, if you have a proposed project, what, where will those improvements um, provide access to, to schools, to local shoppings, medical uses, employment, transit? In addition, um, and this has been a bit controversial, um, whether you're a disadvantaged community, I just did a, the, the map to the right is a, a disadvantaged map for the city of Ontario, of which much of us is disadvantaged, most of the city is disadvantaged. Um, th that is probably less of an issue cycle four than it was in cycle one. That was a bigger issue in cycle one. So while there are points associated with it, most projects um, now can show that they ha are providing uh, access. It may not be going through a disadvantaged neighborhood, or it may be going through a disadvantaged neighborhood, but serving a broader area. You know, as long as you tell your story to explain how it's going to help serve a disadvantaged community, you can get some points out of those questions. Getting your team together is critical. Um, getting people who are engaged in the conversation. I just listed some potential um, people. It, it could be this and so much more, but um, in Ontario, we have we've had difficulty getting community input. We have been building that f with through the Healthy Ontario program, and and so that has been able to to grow. But 
a lot of communities, it's either driven by the community and you can't get City Hall to care, or City Hall cares, but they can't get the community to come out and talk about it. So figuring out ways to do that is, is going to be critical, and I know Edgar's going to, to touch upon some of the, the efforts that he did in Central Valley. In addition, you're going to need to do some quantitative analysis, and some of that is related to bike ped and student counts. Um, Caltrans has recently adopted an interim count guidance um, program. It's 26 pages. It's a lot of math. Um, but if you work your way through it, it helps tell you where should counts be done, how many counts do you need to do, where should they be done, so how to select the locations, and how to conduct the counts and how to get an estimated average daily um, volume. The the um, link at the bottom is the link to that um, to that document to give you some guidance. So uh, any projects after next month going for CTC allocation are going to be required to follow these guidelines. So there'll be apples to apples comparison um, over the long haul on projects. In addition. Um, the uh, uh, there will be a, a guidance document. It's not available yet. Sometime in October, um, on the uh, state public health website, there are going to be some guidance on how to use that interim uh, count guidance, um, and and that's the website that is supposed to be going to eventually. So in addition to uh, collecting how many people are walking and biking in, in your project area, you also have to collect pedestrian and bike collision data. Um, the Active Transportation Resource Center has some flash training, um, again noted there as on, on the link. You uh, can get a TEMS um, traffic, I always forget what it's called, um, it's through UC Berkeley, uh, the um, the logins at the bottom. Just create, it's a free account, just create a free account, they'll send you a password, and then you can start going in and there is a whole module that's about ATP, but you can look at a variety of um, um, collision data. The ATP is obviously related to just um, bike and ped related uh, uh, accidents, but it gives you information that um, that will help guide you as you go forward with what kinds of countermeasures should you be doing to try and um, help mitigate the collisions that are currently occurring in your community. As part of uh, collecting background information, you have to obviously inventory your existing facilities and take photos of those facilities. It's best to have, I tend to like to take photos without people in them, but I'm realizing that that does not communicate as well as people in the photo. <laughs> so um, the picture on the bottom right is a location that we're, propo we're, we're proposing uh, doing some missing sidewalks for cycle five. And it communicates a lot more to show, yeah, somebody wants to walk there and they're having a walk in the dirt along a pretty wide roadway. Um, that kind of thing helps communicate. And then graphically showing where those improvements are, which is kind of the upper left-hand corner. Well, I use GIS because that's a tool I have available and know how to use. I've seen applications who are just using Google Maps to um, communicate their, uh, their, their, their locations of their proposed projects. So you don't have to always go super high-tech um, in, in your, uh, your application as you go forward. I'll do a brief overview on community outreach um, ideas. We have found in our community that we really can't get people to come and talk to us specifically about only this, but we're real good at tagging on other people's projects. So we tagged on for first night out in August for some, some outreach. We tag on to the, the teen action community meetings. We tag on to other um, events at parks to try and gather information. We've done a lot of stuff at um, concerts in the park over the summer, uh, last couple summers to gather information about actor transfer need, actor transportation needs in the community. Um, that's what works for best. If we are a bilingual community, so we do everything in both English and Spanish, and it is important in your application to show that. They, they like to see that you are, you know, if it's you're an English and Korean speaking community, then show it that way, whatever it is appropriate to your community. Um, and I'm not a social media person, but um, a lot of people are, especially the millennial, millennials, and so uh, using so social media, and, and most um, organizations, most cities have a social media outreach 
uh, arm, so working through your communications or media team to try and get tweets out and Instagram things and whatever, all the social media stuff so that people know that you're trying to do a survey or you're trying to get input or, or um, you know, whatever is, is you're, you're trying to gather from the information. We, on our SurveyMonkey, put the SurveyMonkey, um, we took it out and we did a physical survey. They could do the same survey or they could do it online through um, the city's website. They could do it either way and then we just would manually put the, the hand ones in so that we could gather all the information all together. That worked really well for us. Um, other community reach, uh, outreach ideas is to really find where your champions are. I've listed some potential um, um, or organizations or people. Um, some school districts or principals are really um, passionate about this topic and you can really get them engaged. Others not so much. It kind of depends on where your project is and, and how, much, um, how much time and effort it's going to take to gather all these people together uh, to work towards the end goal. It's important that you document all your outreach. So sign in sheets at meetings, agendas, photos of the meetings, all the materials distributed, a summary of the comments received. Um, we have found um, here in Ontario specifically for a variety of things that we don't have we don't do real well with a formal presentation kind of meeting because we don't get the interaction that we want to have. So we have more open house meet and greet kind of thing. So if people can come between, you know, let's say 4 and 7 p.m. and they can kind of come in and they're maybe there for 20 minutes. They give us their input. We, you know, we document their input and, and then they're on their way. They don't have to wait for a presentation that's only going to occur at 7 o'clock or whatever. So that works really well for us. Um, that may not be how your community works, but um, that seems to, on a variety of uh, arenas, has worked well for us. Keep in mind that active transportation grants are to do three things. Increase walking and biking, improving safety for walking walkers and bikers, and overall improving public health. The first two are the most, the highest um, scoring of the questions. Um, and they want as part of that the community outreach and, and so that becomes a scoring aspect too. Consider adding, as Jonathan mentioned, consider adding a non-infrastructure education encouragement component to the project. It, I think it does tend to further the goals of the project and it helps communicate to the community. These are the improvements that were done. Let's let's have you, you know, learn how to use it more correctly or not jaywalk or whatever it is that they're doing that um, to, to, to make them safer and maybe feel more comfortable utilizing the facilities that you're doing improvements on. The project plan should be conceptual in nature. I have been an evaluator for the last three cycles and last cycle, the project may have been a great cycle, a great project. It was engineered plans and I can read engineering plans, but they're eight and a half by 11. You couldn't read a word on the page. It was difficult to tell what was going on. I didn't need that level of detail. To, uh, they should have given me much something much more conceptual. And, and so they didn't do a good job of communicating their project to an evaluator who doesn't know anything about their project because I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not there. It's not in my community. Um, you need to clearly show that it's constructible. So one application I reviewed from a small community in Central Valley, um, they they used Google Earth and pitch and just photographs, and they just did a line across showing this is the width of the street from curb to curb, and showed how how they might make the improvements that they're proposing to make. So they were showing it's constructible because they have the right of way, or it's constructible because they're doing it within the, the existing facilities they have to work with. Um, the other aspect is to make sure that you check the previous application, cycle four, I, I've given the link to, and just click on the project name. Find projects that are, those are the, the, the projects that scored the highest, so got state money, and find projects that are similar to yours. They might help you find the words um, to describe what you're trying to describe. They may um, help you understand the approach and how they were able to tell their story. Looking at the scoring rubrics probably aren't going to change a lot. Maybe the, the, the scoring numbers will change slightly, but it get from cycle four to cycle five. But the scoring rubrics really tell you how um, 
the evaluators are supposed to be scoring what, what the range is and what they're supposed to be looking at. Some are very qualitative and some are very quantitative, but it helps you understand what the evaluator is supposed to be looking at and how they're supposed to be scoring you. And please tell your story. Remember that evaluators are not from your community. In the past, the evaluators were one from Southern California, one from Northern California. You never got a project, you know, in your, con you're, you're required to give your areas of conflict. So for me, it's anything in San Bernardino County. I don't review anything in San Bernardino County. Um, for other people, it may be, you know, other locations, but, um, or other issues, but Remember that they probably don't know your community, so really tell your story. Explain why your, your, the improvements are needed, how it's going gonna, it's gonna to improve um, the community and help to make them safer and help the, to make them want to walk and bike more. Some helpful resources, Active Transportation Resource Center has a growing um, inventory of training, in-person classes, they have the flash training, which I mentioned earlier, that are um, in addition to what I mentioned um, about the TEMS uh, flash training. They also have some guidance on ATP application questions. They have an automated count loan program. Let me underline that. It's brand new. I think it's rolling out in October. They're going to be loaning automated counters for bike and ped counts. Um, and so if you're interested, contact them and see how to get that arranged. If you if you need that kind of assistance, you don't have the ability, you don't have the money to do to do counts. Um, that so they have a program that's just they have three different types of, of counters one is just a ped counter one is just a bike counter and one is a combo and so like a mixed use trail you'd probably use a combo if it's just a sidewalk counting you'd probably just use a ped um, they're temporary in nature you, you know you enter into some kind of agreement with them and then you you send it back to them um, they are providing some technical assistance for dis Advantage communities. In cycle four, they offered technical assistance to five communities. Um, they're supposed to be um, offering assistance to 10 communities this year. If you're interested in that, get um, sign up for to, to be notified of, of uh, their emails because it'll be coming out either this fall or this winter um, and they'll be selecting. I don't know their selection process. I'm not involved in that. But They'll be selecting the 10 communities, and if you're ready to go and need, just need some assistance, that may be a place that you can get some additional assistance. They also have some non-infrastructure workshops that are available um, to assist in understanding how to move that agenda forward. And last but not least, um, I can't draw to save my life, and so I have to use tools that help me make things look professional and look like it is communic communicating something. So I have found Street Mix to be an, an invaluable tool to help explain how I can fit what I want to fit into the, the right of way I've got. This happens to be um, a future um, six lane right away um, and we're adding a bike facility to it and uh, and then sidewalks but I, I needed to, sh to communicate both internally and to, um, to to the outside world how we can fit within the right of way what we're trying to achieve and so that again it's free um, it's best to use it in Chrome um, it seems to have trouble with um, Internet Explorer but um, it's a really good tool to try and help you communicate what you're trying to achieve at least in a cross-section perspective it's back to you, Jonathan. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, let me bring my slides back up here. Our next speaker is Edgar Garabay. He's community, uh, community relations manager at the Tuolumne River Trust. Uh, he comes to the TRT from the San Joaquin Valley nonprofit sector with experience in community organizing, coalition building, advocacy, and volunteer recruitment. Uh, Edgar works with residents living in underserved Riverside communities with a primary focus uh, in Modesto's airport neighborhood uh, to participate in grassroots actions in the neighborhood via community collaborative discussions, town hall meetings, and meetings with decision makers and elected officials. 
He also coordinates uh, recreational activities and community events to engage and inform residents of communities near the river to participate in activities such as river and community cleanups, canoe trips, cycling, and nature hikes. Uh, Edgar worked with Stanislaus County uh, in ATP Cycle 4 on the Airport Neighborhood Active Transportation Connectivity and Safety Project, quite a mouthful, which was uh, received a score of 93.5 and was funded in the statewide component. Over to you, Edgar. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone that uh, is listening. And uh, again, I can't stress this enough. I'll say this throughout the presentation that it's definitely it's a community relationships, building those community relations. Um, as you can see on the screen, it is a, a picture that has many collaborative, uh, both public agencies, community residents, um, uh, different uh, community organizations. Um, and this was uh, back in 20. Uh, 16, which was in California Walks, a, a, a workshop. So I'll talk a little bit more about all of that. Um, this is the agenda uh, for what I'll be discussing today. Um, so this is a map of the project uh, that was uh, uh, developed. Uh, you'll see it in, um, I'll talk a little bit in more detail, but the basis is, is along the the green portion in the, in the, in the middle of the neighborhood are, um, is a uh, multimodal um, pedestrian and bicycle uh, to get through through the neighborhood um, and also safe routes identified safe routes to the only uh, uh, the only school in the neighborhood which is an elementary school Orville Wright uh, you see the the river along with the dotted yellow lines uh, so that that's how we um, have been able to uh, participate and I'll talk a little bit about more about the Tuolumne River Trust and how we've been involved uh, the history of the of the neighborhood itself it was settled by dust bowl immigrants in the 1930 it was known back then as little oklahoma it is a small community uh, that has about 6,000 residents uh hampered by a variety of different um factors which are the geographic location uh jurisdiction it's half uh county and half city of modesto uh different socioeconomic challenges infrastructure uh, and recreational activities are lacking. And obviously um, it has, um, as in a variety of underserved neighborhoods here in Modesto, uh, activity in some of these neighborhoods and, and have a negative reputation. Um, this neighborhood, as well as others along the river or riverside communities are is home to the Tuolumne River, river parks and uh, it's particularly in the airport neighborhood where I do a majority of my work is a small group of active resident leaders. So um, the Tuolumne River Trust, we are a river-wide, uh, rivershed organization, uh, meaning uh, we span the whole 162 miles of the Tuolumne River, and we work with a variety of uh, community partners in improving the health of the river and the riverside community through education. So it's informing and educating the public about the, the river, uh, recreation, getting more people out to the river and developing and having them develop a relationship with the river. Uh, the events, uh, through the events, obviously we do for it to look at for advocating for protection and better management of the river, uh, the river parks and, and the well-being of the community and restoration work uh, that's done through uh, repairing of different um, projects along the river uh, so repairing floodplains and river front land, as well as working with community um, to develop, um, to work on uh, community cleanups. So we began work here in the airport neighborhood back in 2009 by launching the Nature uh, and Neighborhoods Initiative to work side by side with, again, a collaborative, in a collaborative way with business, local government, the school, uh, which is the hub of the neighborhood community organizers and partners to provide opportunities to the residents for participation in the revitalization of the neighborhood, uh, the river, and again, the local parks. So one way that we've uh, done that, this was uh, established by Orville Wright Healthy Start Administrator, which is a local elementary school, and the principal. Um, we co-chair that. It is a, a loose collaborative that meets monthly throughout the school year. Uh, the purpose is uh, to engage with both residents and all of the members that you see that are included in these uh, partnerships to work along with the interest in supporting both the school and the neighborhood or the community health, safety, well-being, um, 
through a variety of different activities, community events, and identified projects. So the other arm of, of this comes through uh, two other uh, initiatives. So the ANC is the, or the Airport Neighborhood Collaborative is the overall arm in this community um, and working together with the Parent Cafe, which is a service-based um, uh, bi-monthly, uh, they meet twice a month to, to, to look at the different services um, that are available to community. Um, the second arm of this is the charlas comunitarias, so the community chats, where resident leaders participate to uh, both identify and prioritize what are the community needs and projects, both within the community and the school. Um, they also, through these, uh, learn about advocacy, civic engagement, organization, and participating in community school events. These meet twice a month during the school year. Um, and as we've been working with the community since 2009, leaders are, are looking to develop a committee that will work, that is continuously working with the ANC to address both school and neighborhood um, health, safety, well-being, um, and, and uh, community events and identified projects. So uh, through the last couple of years, we've worked together with a variety of different partners to develop um, different uh, initiatives and supporting the residents as um, it leads up to um, the safe routes uh, to school. So again, we've worked on community capacity building, civic engagement opportunities. Um, we worked with um, recreational opportunities or activities both within the community as it's a community that lacks these opportunities. And uh, through the charlas uh, or the community chats, we discuss a variety of the, the different needs of the community, such as safe routes to school, um, discuss, discussing and connecting that with the lack of infrastructure, particularly more on the county side of the neighborhood, which is the top half that is uh, in a map that you'll see down um, in a couple slides that relates to the uh, lack of infrastructure. Um, the sewer infrastructure has gone in, um, yet there are still um, areas that do not have um, sidewalks, curb gutter and sidewalks. So something that the community is very much interested in, um, health and well-being through uh, um, the community cleanups that we do both at the river um, and in the community. Those are called the Love Airport um, slash Adopt a River, where we have um, a variety of different community partners that participate in this. Uh, public safety, very much our law enforcement uh, and animal control, uh, working with public agencies and respective departments um, to work together towards improvement of community members, um, towards uh, of, of the community and its members that live there. Um, over the last, uh, uh, since 2015, we have um, worked on three different walking audits. Uh, one was through, one was conducted through um, ourselves con uh, working together with the county on uh, airport uh, neighborhood urban greening master plan, which that was uh, provided through a through a state grant to provide a plan for urban uh, for a green green urbaning of the neighborhood. Um, in 2016, we worked together collaboratively. Uh, I was in another role with another agency before I uh, started working here at the Tuolumne River Trust with California Walks to both do a second audit and again assessing the walkability of the streets and the sidewalks in in the neighborhood. Um, and comes with a respective report, which we will discuss later. And, and again, the National Safe Routes to School Partnership in 2018 with an action plan to look at the broader picture of the neighborhood and how this can uh, lend a hand to other um, schools in uh, Modesto City School and Stanislaus County Office of Education. So in all of this, we work together very closely with, with our two um, um, agencies or nonprofits uh, at the state level. Uh, and then here regionally with our respective public agencies, Stanislaus County, City of Modesto, and uh, has been very vital uh, throughout the process um, is um, our Stanislaus County Public Health has been very, uh, very much uh, participating in all of these, um, in all these events. Again, data was, was collected. Um, there's other Safe Routes to School initiatives um, that led to this um, about, um, as you see in your top left-hand corner, stop signs and crosswalks were actually implemented. Um, one side of the school, uh, the school itself, 
in uh, the elementary school did not have any uh, stop signs uh, as of about six years ago. So through those efforts, it has led to uh, stop signs being installed in crosswalks for the safety of the students. It has led to the development of uh, about two, three years ago, a walking school bus where it is uh, parents are taking, are, pick, are providing through safe routes to the neighborhood identified and working with the school um, as well as uh, County Public Health um, to develop this. Now they're doing this three times a week uh, where we piloted it a couple of years ago and it was one day a week. Uh, we've also done and worked with Safe Kids Coalition, Stanislaus County Safe Kids Coalition, um, on national bike and walk to school days. Uh, and then we tailored it off as well with recreation, where this started with a dad and me bike ride, led to the um, idea and development of a bike club and working directly with the, with the school children, uh, with, the, with the students and the parents as well, being engaged in um, active uh, living, healthy eating, uh, initiatives as well that are being um, done in this process. So the Airport Bicycle Club is where kids learn not only how to ride a bi bicycle safely, but also they um, are able to um, learn the ABCs, the air, bike, and, and chain. In other words, how to fix a bicycle. So this is the timeline that I won't go through, but basically it aligns what has been done as well as the reports, both from um, from the Community Pedestrian and Bicycle Safety Training Program uh, through California Walks, as well as the Airport Neighborhood Action Plan through the National Safe Routes to School. Um, as well, you'll see um, to your left, again, um, the students were surveyed back in 2017. And again, we have to do another count of what, how are they um, brought to school, uh, whether it's walking, biking, or being dropped off. And lastly, again, this project, what will allow it to do, it's a $4.9 million project. And the way that we did was being able to partner with a lot of our respective agency through these workshops and being able to do the walking audits and through the uh, monthly airport neighborhood collaborative meetings and other projects that have led to the development of this, which will provide new sidewalks, bikeways, and various safety improvements that will continue towards a safer environment in the neighborhood. In addition to the sidewalks, those that are bike lanes are identified in the map. Um, and so that's what this uh, $4.9 million project will, will allow to build a safer community. And the other remaining million dollars will come from the COG. Additionally, another project that has come to um, is also a um, improvement, safety improvement, along with local uh, measure dollars, something called Measure L in the front of Oral Wright Elementary School. So there's a variety of different projects. And again, um, also the different news outlets that were able to uh, talk about the Airport Neighborhood Active Transportation Project. And here's my contact information if anyone would like to be in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you, Edgar. Um, and our last presenter is Corey Wilkerson. Uh, active Transportation pr uh, Coordinator at the City of Santa Ana. Uh, he describes himself as possibly the most unprofessional professional in the field. He's a transportation planner uh, passionate about getting things done. His primary responsibility is the planning and implementation of Santa Ana's active transportation program. Uh, and in his five years in the city, he has completed a Vision Zero plan, two complete streets plans, an active transportation plan, and is currently working on a safer school plan. Uh, with these plans, uh, he has successfully pursued $60 million in grant funds, uh, which includes a total of 21 successful ATP applications for a total of $53 million across all four ATP cycles. Uh, so he is the master of the ATP. I'll hand it over to you. All right. Um, so like uh, Jonathan said, I um, in the city of Santa Ana, we take this program very seriously. Um, we very aggressively go after these grant funds. Um, the picture you're seeing on your screen is the all the work that we put into cycle four. Um, we submitted 18 grant applications, a total of $120 million worth of ask. Every single one of those applications was was done in-house by city staff um, and and prepared. We didn't take a single day off in the month of July in 2018. 
most of us were working 14, 16 hour days during that month. Um, as we did the big push to try and get these applications out the door. Um, at, like Jonathan mentioned, we've been, we've been very, very lucky to, to secure a, a lot of ATP funding in each of the cycles. Each year it's gotten um, progressively a little bit more, a little bit more. Um, and uh, this, this last cycle, we only funded four projects, but it was about $21 million worth of funding. Um, so we're, we're, uh, we, we do definitely do a big push. Um, one of the first things that I usually will tell people as they're preparing for an upcoming cycle and what, what was initially asked of me when, when we were discussing this, this webinar, um, you know, you can take a look at your previous applications that you've done, um, but it's important to really ask yourself, what about the application made it so that you didn't get funding? Um, Sometimes it might be that the location is bad, um, that, that the location is someplace that, that um, is not a prime location where they would want to fund a project. Other times the project is not sexy enough. You don't, um, you're not really pushing the envelope. Um, the first thing that I, you know, that I try and tell people is like if, if you're looking at location, you should be looking at your disadvantaged community maps and, I, and, and asking yourself, is this project going to provide access in neighborhoods um, where the where the need is the greatest? Um, what Edgar was just talking about a moment ago, and looking at those pictures, you can see that there's a there's a there's a significant need in that neighborhood for this types of improvements, and that's really where the funding should probably be going. Um, I would feel bad writing an application and competing against a project like Edgar's, um, knowing that, that the need is so great there. Um, and so you've got to ask yourself, is this the right funding source for the project that we're, that we're interested in or that the community is asking for? Another thing that's important to look at is, is what, what's the collision patterns in the community where the, the project is being proposed? Um, what's the demographics of, the, of, the, of that community? Um, is there a high propensity of 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 non choice walking and biking people that are that are dependent on walking and biking in order to get to work to get to school to get to do shopping um, and ask yourselves whether or not that that is um, that the need is really significant there because that's where these funding should be going so if you have a project that if you have a location where you know there's a community that's in need and there's improvements that are needed it doesn't have to be something epic it doesn't have to be anything that 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 sexy it can just be simple things like crosswalks rectangular rapid flashing beacons um low cost improvements that are going to improve pedestrian activity putting in sidewalks where there's no sidewalks that are already there simple striped bike lanes to improve to improve access for bicyclists um, it doesn't have to be anything more than that if you're in a, if you're working in a community where where the the need is already great that there's already a huge gap um, in infrastructure in the community once you've identified that you really do need to start collecting data right away um, if you're looking now projecting out to ATP cycle five you should be doing walking and biking counts now you should be doing your vehicle counts now. You should be collecting your, your collision data now. Um, all of those things are going to be feeding into the application. And if, if you're not collecting it now you're, and you start getting closer and closer to those application cycles, um, it, it's going to become more difficult. Um, we've had issues where, um, where we've been contacting um, traffic count companies to go out and do just basic uh, car counts and you know as you get into closer to the cycle the companies are busy they're getting asked from every community in the area to come out and do counts and it gets harder and harder to schedule them on top of that we have the unfortunate problem that a lot of times the cycles seem to be getting more and more into the summertime um, and you really want to be collecting the data during during the school year when 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 the traffic volumes are more stable and, and you can get an actual picture of what's going on. During the summertime, you see different patterns. Um, I wanna talk about 
a little bit about what kind of give some case studies about some of the success stories that we've had in Santa Ana. Um, and a lot of it is really all built around um, community-based partnerships, community-based organizations that that I've been able to partner with in order to facilitate some of the, a lot of these applications and the outreach activities. I'm just a single person in my agency. I, 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 when, when it comes time to actually do the applications, there's about three of us that um, on city staff that will work on these applications, but the coordination and the outreach is all, um, is all just me. So I really work and rely a lot on the community-based organizations that we have existing in Santa Ana. If you're looking right now and you, you're preparing, you're thinking about we want to we want to maybe go after some some funding in ATP Cycle Five. What should we be going after? This is a good place to start to try and identify what some of the needs are in the community. A lot of times, these community-based organizations have already done a tremendous amount of outreach. Um, these kids that you see in this picture. Um, were, are from an organization called KidWorks, and they had partnered with the healthcare agency, that's Mary from the healthcare agency sitting there in the middle with her eyes closed, um, to do a bikeability assessment in, in, in what is essentially central Santa Ana. Um, and so these kids had gone out and they had they'd collected a lot of data. They had, they, had, they had done counts, they had done interviews, they had done surveys, and they had identified specific projects that they wanted to see implemented. So they gave us a, they gave me a presentation shortly after I started with the city, and I was like, "Wow, this is amazing! These kids have done a lot of work." And I asked them, "Hey, would you guys want to write a grant application?" And they said, "Yeah." So they uh, so we went out in the field and collected some data. We we took measurements of the cross section of the of the street, what the widths are, which varied along the corridor. Um, these kids didn't want to go after a program; they wanted to go after actual infrastructure something in the ground um, that would improve safety in the, in their neighborhood. Um, and so these kids went out and collected data. They did, I taught them how to do order of magnitude cost estimating. They essentially became little engineers. And these are, these are middle school and high school students that were doing all of this work. And so they identified the project. They wanted to do, they wanted to take a big wide arterial like this one you see here in the picture. And they wanted to add protective bike lanes to it. And so they, they, they wrote the grant application themselves. It's the only grant application since I've been with the city that was not written by city staff, was written by a group of kids in Santa Ana. And we literally, they brought it the day it was due. We printed it up, signed it, and off it went as they wrote it. It was, it was fantastic. And it was one of three projects at the state level that was funded in Orange County for, um, for uh, ATP Cycle 2. Another project that I worked on, um, an organization called Latino Health Access participated in a program called the Resident Leadership Academy. This was another project that was funded initially by the healthcare agency with a very small amount of seed dollars to, to teach community folks how to educate other community folks about walking, biking, health issues, um, blight issues, safety issues in their communities. Um, and they started this, this, this group called the resident, they, they called the resident leadership Academy. And, um, they developed a curriculum that we, that we've been able to use. Um, and so Latino health access went out and they did, um, you know, they did walk and they walked door to door and, and knock on people's doors and ask them, ask them questions and collect input from them. Um, in a particular neighborhood, they, they, they lead bike rides that, that, um, in the neighborhood to, to look at what some of the needs are in the in the neighborhood and find out where where the need is the greatest. Um, they do mapping exercises, sitting around a map like a bunch of planners pointing at maps, um, and 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 it's all done in the community's language, with the community, and with folks that actually live in the community. Um, on this particular project, it was a uh, um, another wide arterial. Um, in an, in a neighborhood that is that is meets every single one of the disadvantaged community criteria, um, and it's one of the projects that we submitted in cycle four uh, to to receive um, to receive funding. It's a, it's a seven million dollar protected bike lane project um, that we got in cycle four, and all of the outreach, all of the work um, was led by community based organizations, and then I just took all that work that they did and I submitted it as an application. 
when you're doing these applications, Jonathan mentioned it a little earlier um, about the, the combination applications. Um, one of the ways that you can help build the capacity of these community organizations and keep them actively engaged is to, is to include programs with your infrastructure applications um, that, that is something that the community organizations could then implement. You could hire these organizations to come out and, and give out helmets and lights to, to lead bike rodeos with kids um, so that they can, when the time comes that the infrastructure is actually being built, they can join you on the bike ride to actually see the infrastructure, which is kind of the goal, I think, of what, of what we're all trying to do is to, is to deliver projects that, that are based on community need, that are identified by the community themselves, and that they themselves can benefit from. So that's all that I have. I'm gonna go ahead and hand it back over to Jonathan and let him uh, uh, wrap this up. Thank you, Corey. Um, sorry, one second here. Um, so we are running a little bit short on time, um, but I have been answering some questions in the, uh, the chat box. Um, and we're not going to be able to get them directly to uh, the presenters. Um, but my information is right here up on the screen. Um, just quickly, there is a question about the interim count methodology. And the answer is yes, you should be able to go ahead and use it. Um, it's been sent out now. Um, and even if it's revised somewhat, uh, your results should be uh, accepted in cycle five. Um, so here is uh, the information about how to get in touch with us. I wanted to thank again. Uh, Melanie, Edgar, and Corey for presenting. Um, and with that, I think we're just hitting up against noon. Um, and we might be able to take a few more questions in the box there. Uh, but we wanted to thank you for attending. Um, and good luck in cycle five.